Welcome to part three of series on passing your instrument check ride. So in this series, I'm going to give some specific tips to help you with your instrument flying that would be good to put into practice before you actually get to check ride day. Check ride day should do what you've been doing if it's working for you. But these are some tricks and tips that can help you. So let's start off with briefings. I mentioned in the previous video that briefings are really important for instrument flying. And so whatever method that you are using, you should do that organized pattern so that you can do the briefing the same way each time. Also, slow down your briefing. I hear a lot of students go blasting through their briefing too quickly because it's kind of rote and they're not actually thinking about what is really going on. For example, I've got a, a picture of a, st a couple step down altitudes and I hear people just brief, oh, I'm just going to 860 feet, but they haven't briefed that there's a level off at the BOR. They haven't briefed that there's a level off in between. And so that is important. Secondly, I've got up here a picture of our descent angle because you also want to look at your winds aloft and think about your ground speed and how that is going to affect your angle of descent and include that in your briefing. Also be able to readjust. Sometimes you may have to rebrief something like if you're thinking a circle to land is going to work in one way, but then ATC gives you something else, make sure you go back through and rebrief that item again. I like to say for circle to land, for example, I am when I get visual, I am going to turn, insert right or left, whatever, to enter a whatever part of the pattern and I will draw it out somehow on a kneeboard or a scratch pad or something. I also really like mnemonics. So for my pre-takeoff briefing, my departure briefing, here is an example mnemonic that, that I personally like. Um, it's called the Rockter Brief. And so you can start with briefing like the runway. Am I lined up to the right runway? Is it bugged on my heading indicator? Obstacles, are there any that I'm worried about? Is there an obstacle departure procedure? What is my climb performance needed? If there is something like that for this obstacle departure procedure, when I, can I make any turns on my procedure or is it just the standard no turns below 400 feet AGL for standard instrument briefing for standard instrument departure. What will we do if there's an engine failure? And that will include an abort point on the runway. What is my plan? And then finally, what is my plan for coming back to this airport if we have some sort of urgent condition? Will the weather even allow me to return to this airport? It's possible under part 91, see my other video about part 91 takeoff minimums, it's possible to take off under instrument flight rules and not be able to return to the airport I'm leaving from. So like, what's my plan? What am I going to do if, if that's the case? What airport should I go to? I want to have that planned. I want to have the approach plate handy for either if I'm coming back or going somewhere else, if I can't return to where I left from. Next, I want to make sure I know the airplane's performance. And what I've done for this is I just made a little chart. So for the Skyhawk, I went out one day on a nice calm day and I went ahead and basically charted out for my specific plane that these are different configurations. So flaps zero and flaps 10. I generally fly approaches with flaps 10, but you can do it with zero. Um, and then I looked at my pitch attitude and different airspeed combinations, different power combinations. So I keep this little paper handy in my kneeboard. I'm an old school person. I still have some paper stuff. Um, and I keep it handy so that like, for example, the bottom part of my table here, like for example, if I want to get a 400 foot per minute descent rate, because of my ground speed required to maintain a three degree glide slope, then I know I should set the flaps to 10, my power at 2000, and 90 is my airspeed. I mean, that's what I do for my airplane. Again, you've got to develop this for your own airplane, but it's two and a half degrees down on my pitch attitude. And so when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about looking at this chart 
on my approach and saying, oh, okay, well, oh, today my ground speed, I'm looking at my GPS and saying, oh, oh, wow, I have quite a tailwind today. Oh, I'm doing like 120. All right, if I'm doing 120, well, then I better adjust this, okay? So if I'm going to be doing a 120 knots over the ground, wow, then I need more like a 640, 650 foot per minute descent rate. Okay, then I better take the flaps out, or have the flaps at 10, but have my power to 1900, and I am going to do a pitch attitude of three and a half degrees pitch down. Okay, so that's what I mean by this pitch, my known pitch and known power setting, known configuration, flaps 10, flaps zero, is your gear up, gear down, whatever. My Skyhawk gear is always down, obviously. <laughs> and that gives me the performance I want. So pitch plus power plus configuration should give me my performance. This only works though if I've got a handle on what my airplane can do, and that takes time, knowing your own airplane. Secondly, I want people to avoid chasing needles when partial panel. Okay, here is my tips. For the Skyhawk, this works really well. Where the standby attitude indicator is, it's, it's kind of a bad spot. Uh, it's worse from the left seat as far as the right seat. But what I will do is I just adjust my seat down. Like I will crank it down or slouch in my seat deliberately so that I can see that standby attitude indicator full on. I also, again, I'm going to try really hard to follow a known pitch attitude and a known power setting so that uh, that works on my standby and attitude indicator as well. And the third little trick I have, this is, this is disgusting, but it was told to me once and it really works. A lot of problems on partial panel happen when, when you get nervous and you start gripping the yoke, like death grip. Like, oh my gosh, I'm holding it really tight. All right, what I recommend, you gotta back off, okay? You gotta pretend like your dog did a poop and I'm gonna go out and pick up the poop in a bag, but I gotta be really careful picking up the poop. I really don't wanna squish the poop. So I'm gonna hold the yolk like I don't wanna squish the poop. Lightly grip the yolk. That's gonna help from not over controlling the airplane. Frequently, you can trim the airplane out where you just need a little bit of pressure on the yoke. Relax, okay? Another thing I did once with a student was I, this is almost torturous, but I took two thumbtacks and I taped them to the yoke so that the student couldn't grip the yoke very hard because he was just in this death grip mode. And I'm like, here's some thumbtacks and you have to grip the thing like it's a bag of dog poop and you don't wanna squish it. All right, I mentioned tips and tricks and mnemonics. I do really like mnemonics and memory aids. So when we're turning on final approach, I use the high ma check. Number one, is my heading indicator aligned? That's HI, high. High ma, basically heading indicator, is it aligned? Mode, super important. Am I in the right mode? If I'm flying an RNAV approach, do we have pink needles on? If I'm flying a ground-based nav like an ILS or a VOR or a localizer, then I should be in the right mode. And so for G1000s, green needles, am I in the right mode? And lastly, enunciators, like make sure my nav aid is actually being received. I don't have any off flags. On my G1000 enunciators for a GPS approach, am I in the right mode? Am I in LPV for LPV minimums, LNAV minimums, what, whatever? Am I right? So that's my high ma check, and I use that when turning on final approach. So getting a little farther down final approach, I recommend doing something over your final approach fix. And so what I use is called the six T's. Okay, and we'll go through the T's. Number one is twinkle. All right. Is my final approach course on the right course? Is the GPS on the right mode, LPV or LNAV or whatever? Also at a non-towered twinkle lights, Turn on the lights, pilot controlled lighting, if that's available, that's gonna really help. I talked about that in video two in the series. Okay, so twinkle, then time. Some approaches still have time where you have to start the timer to know where the missed approach is. So start the timer, twinkle, time, turn the airplane. There are plenty of approaches. Here's an example in uh, Washington state where we have to turn over 
that final approach fix. I didn't put the final approach fix on here, but it is that VOR. And you see, we are turning from 274 degrees to 244 degrees. Can't tell you how many times I've seen people not make this turn when we're flying this approach in the simulator. So, turn the airplane. Next, I'm going to twist the OBS. Like for this one, I would have to twist my OBS from 274 to 244, unless my G1000 does it for me. Depends. But twist the altitude bug also to your next step down, possibly to the lowest altitude you're going to, or twist it up to for your altitude bug up for the mist approach. But twist our OBS and twist the altitude bug as needed. Talk, super important at non-towered airport. Report your position to the tower if required. Or, yeah, reporting my position at a non-towered airport. And have I been cleared to land? Are my tires down? Three green for a retractable gear airplane. So twinkle time, turn, twist, talk, tires. That's the T's. You can eliminate tires if you're flying a fixed gear airplane, of course. Let's talk about some other resources I love in the G1000. So in the G1000, we have this track vector. Okay, the track vector in, in this picture is curving. So actually, I don't recommend using the 30 second or one minute track vector because you will get these weird curvy lines. Uh, in the G1000, I recommend if you have that, set the track vector to two minutes and that's going to predict where you're at. And you can use it when you're doing holding patterns. So you can use that track vector. You can use that track vector to say, oh, I'm going to, I want to intercept my final approach course before the final approach fix. I can use that track vector. Turn that thing on. Two minute setting will avoid the curving lines. Next resource is you as PIC telling ATC unable. I cannot do what they just told me to do. Um, I have had a few very strange holding pattern clearances given to me and a student, and we just told them unable. Or have they just all of a sudden switched my circling direction? Uh, unable. Did they tell you to turn off the runway onto a taxiway? You can't make it without squealing the tires. Unable. Okay, practice saying unable when you get those kind of crazy things. Your PIC, and that's going to help demonstrate to your pilot examiner that you are PIC. If you've got an autopilot, hey, know how to use it. Use it as a resource. Don't just get relying on it constantly like a crutch, but know how to use it. Know the different modes. Know how it works. That will really help you. So I promised was going to mention again, circle the land. So I see a lot of problems with this. So what I recommend, number one, you plan this thing out, okay? Knowing what you need to do. Do not wait until it is too late to slow down the airplane and descend for your circle to land. Also, clearly tell the examiner when you are going to go below your minimum descent altitude to land, then follow through. But have a place before you break out. Have a plan in place. Know ahead of time if your airport uses left or right traffic, for example. Um, Pre-brief if you are going to make a left turn or a right turn once you get visual. So try as much as possible with flaps, with your gear putting down, your normal pattern flying. Here's an example um, from an airport local to me that I frequently go to, Vivian, Louisiana. And it says very clearly on the notes here, circling not authorized north of runway 9 or 27. This actually leads you to have to make right traffic but under part 91, you can't make right traffic if it's not published and Vivian does not have right traffic published for, those, for that runway. So this is super weird. So what I found from the, if the wind is from the east, you cannot circle at Vivian because there's no legal way to do it. So what I want you to do is when you're thinking about airports you might go to, especially smaller airports or with the circling not authorized provisions, think that through like before you get there on your check ride. A check ride day is not really the way to figure this all out. You can pre-think through all of these things beforehand. With the missed approach, have this thing set up. Like don't just rush into the briefing and then not be ready. Um, plan everything out. Load up everything you can with the nav aids. Have the nav aids loaded up and tuned if you can for the missed approach. And always be ready to actually 
fly the missed approach. Have these nav aids ready and stand by and then ready to switch them on. I see too many people having problems because they haven't really planned on flying the missed approach or they didn't brief it adequately going back to the briefing. So finally, I want to just mention your new instrument rating. I strongly recommend setting personal limitations. So this is the forum that we use where I work. And so I recommend you go to with your flight instructor that you've been working with and set personal limitations. So set some limits based on what you've had experience flying in. Maybe you don't do circling approaches at night at all. Okay, maybe you never feel comfortable doing that. And that's, that's okay. So build in some of your own personal limitations that you set with a flight instructor, like before you get out there in the world flying under actual IMC or instrument meteorological conditions. And lastly, I just want to have a couple safety words. Fuel planning, land. I recommend planning to land with what AOPA calls the golden hour or one hour of fuel in your tanks. This is always common sense from a safety standpoint. Icing, be careful. Make sure that you don't go into icing conditions if your airplane is not certificated for flight and known icing. If you do have an airplane that is equipped, know how to use the de-icing systems. Descendable VFR is something that we always want to think about also when we're flying in the instrument flight world. What descendable VFR is, is what I'm going to do as a pilot before I go out in a single engine airplane or even a multi-engine airplane, I want to know, can my airplane get in current fuel range to an area where I could break out of the clouds and get to an airport under VFR? Because if I like have, for example, a complete electrical failure, I have a compass, I don't have any navigational aids, I might have my cell phone, but I want to know what direction, north, south, east, west, where is it? Descendable VFR. Is it within my fuel range for the airplane? I just identify that, pre-identify before I launch on a flight in instrument meteorological conditions. So I just always think that that is the best idea to have that thought through. Be ready to do it. So I hope that this video series has helped you with passing your instrument check ride. Would love to know how it goes. Put some comments. Maybe you have your own tips or tricks. I'd love to hear back from you guys. And thank you so much for the support. Do not forget to like and subscribe. Watch the other videos in this series about passing your instrument check ride.